Hello and welcome back to Lily's Viking Adventure. If you're new, give us a sub. Uh, if you've been here a while, give us a like. That helps us with the algorithms. Today I am going to read to you summaries, chapter summaries, of the Eric the Red Saga. And I will at some point in the very near future be reading the Eric the Red Saga in its entirety. But for now, I'm going to do the summaries. That way you kind of have an idea. Sometimes it's a little difficult to understand what they're saying, especially for the translations that I'll be using. They're older. Um, so it's good to, to listen to the summary and know what's going on. And then when you hear the actual saga, it can help you understand what's going on. So we'll get started. Chapter 1. The Viking conqueror of Dublin, Olaf the White, was married to Odd the Deep-Minded, who became a Christian. Following Olaf's death in battle, she and their son Thorstein, the Red, left Ireland for the Hebrides, where Thorstein became a great warrior king. Upon his death, she sailed to Orkney, where she got married off she married off Thorstein's daughter, Groa, and then to Iceland, where she had relatives and gave extensive land grants to those in her party. Chapter 2. Eric the Red's thralls start a landslide that destroys a farm, leading to a feud that results in Eric's banishment, first from the district and then from Iceland. He sails in search of land that had been reported to lie to the north and explores and names Greenland, choosing an attractive name to encourage colonists. Where he settles becomes known as Eric's Fjord. Chapter 3 Thorbjorn, a son of a well-born thrall who had, been who had accompanied Odd the Deep-Minded, and been given land by her, has a daughter named Gudrid. One autumn, he proudly rejects a marriage proposal for her from Ianar, a wealthy merchant who is also the son of a freedman. However, he is in financial difficulties. The following spring, he announces he will leave Iceland and go to Greenland. The ship carrying his family and friends encounters bad weather and they reach Greenland only in autumn, after half have died of disease. Chapter 4 Famine is raging in Greenland that winter. Thorkell, the prominent farmer with whom Fjordborn's group is staying, asks a wandering scythe worker called Thorbjörg, the little Volva, to come to the winter feast and prophecy so that the people of the locality will know when conditions will improve. She asks for someone to sing Vart Lokur, warding songs. Gudrid, although reluctant because she is Christian, her father has left while the heathen practice is going on, learned, from, learned them from her foster mother and does so beautifully. Thorbjörg prophecies that the famine will soon end and that Gudrid will make two good marriages, one in Greenland and a second in Iceland, from which will come a great family. In the spring, Thorbjorn sails to Bratahild, where Eric the Red welcomes him and gives him land. Chapter 5 This chapter introduces Eric the Red's son, Leif, and Thorstein. Leif sails to Norway, but is blown off course to the Hebrides, where he conceives a son, Thorgils, by a well-born woman whom he declines to marry. When Thorgils is grown, his mother sends him to Greenland, where Leif recognizes him. In Norway, Leif becomes part of the court of King Olaf Tryggvason, who charges him with preaching Christianity when he returns to Greenland. On the return voyage, storms take him to an unknown land where he discovers wild wheat, 
vines, maple trees, and in one version of the saga, very large trees. Leif also rescues shipwrecked sailors when he looks after converts to Christianity. Back in Greenland, he converts many people, including his mother, who builds a church, but not his father, Eric, as a result of which Eric's wife leaves him. His brother, Thorstein, then organizes an expedition to explore the new country. In addition to both brothers, the group is to include their father, but Eric falls from his horse and is injured riding to the ship. One of the two versions suggests he nonetheless goes. The expedition is unsuccessful. After being blown in different directions by storms all summer, they return to Eriksfurt in the fall. Chapter 6. Thorstein marries Gudrid, but soon after dies in an epidemic at the farm where they are living with the joint owner, another Thorstein and his wife Sigrid. Shortly before his death, Sigrid, who has died, rises as the Rauger and tries to climb into bed with him. After his death, he himself reanimates to ask Gudrid to speak and asks to speak to Gudrid. He tells her to end the Greenland Christian practice of burying people in unconsecrated ground and to bury him at the church blames recent hauntings on the farm overseer Gardi, whose body he says should be burned and predicts a great future for her but warns her not to marry another greenlander and asks her to give money to the church he then died soon after in his old cottage house made of human remains chapter seven Thorfinn Karlsnefi, a wealthy Icelandic merchant, visits Greenland as part of a trading party in two ships. They spend the winter at Bratahild and assist Eric the Red in providing a magnificent Yule feast. Karlsnefi then asks to marry Gudrid, and the feast is extended as a wedding feast. Chapter 8 a group of 160 people in two ships, including Karl Sneffi and other Icelanders, but mostly Greenlanders, set out to find the land to the west, now dubbed Vindland. The wind carries them to a place they call Heluland, where there are large slabs of stone and many foxes. Then south to a wooded area they call Markland, and a promontory they call Kjarlalnes. They put in at a bay and have two fast-running Scottish thralls. Gifts from King Olaf to Leif Eriksson. Scout the land and they bring back grapes and wheat. They overwinter inland from a fjord that they found called Stromfjord in mountainous country with tall grass. An island at the mouth of the fjord is full of nesting birds. Despite having brought grazing animals, they are unprepared for the harshness of winter there and run short of food. Thorhall the hunter, a pagan friend and servant of Eric's, then disappears and they find him after three days lying on a clifftop, mumbling and pinching himself. Soon, a strange kind of whale washes up on shore. The meat sickens them all, and then Thorhall claims credit for it as an answer to his making a poem for Thor, <coughs> whom he calls Fultri, patron deity. So they throw the rest over the cliff and pray to God. The weather then clears, and they have good fishing and enough food. Chapter 9 in spring, most of the expedition decide to go south in search of Vinland. Thorhall wants to go north and is joined on one ship by nine others. But the wind drives the ship east across the Atlantic to Ireland, where they are beaten and made slaves and Thorhall dies. 
Chapter 10. The larger expedition, led by Carl Sneffy, discovers a place they call Hop, Tidal River, where a river flows through a lake to the sea. The country is rich in wildlife, fishing is excellent, wheat and grapes grow plentifully, and it does not snow that winter. They have a first encounter with natives they call Skraelings. They use boats covered in animal skins and wave sticks in the air that make a threshing sound. The Norsemen display a white shield as a sign of peace. Chapter 11. The Skraelings return in a larger group and the Norse trade red cloth for animal pelts, refusing to also trade swords and spears until the Skraelings take fright and leave at the sight of a bull that has got loose. Three weeks later, they return in still larger numbers, whirling the sticks counterclockwise rather than clockwise and howling. Battle is joined and the Skraelings use something like a ballista to hurl a large heavy sphere over the Norsemen's heads, causing them to retreat. Freydis, an illegitimate daughter of Eric the Red, then emerges from her hut, heavily pregnant, and pursues them, berating them as cowards. When the Skraelings surround her, she pulls a sword from a dead man's hand, bears one breast, and slaps the sword against it, which frightens the Skraelings into leaving. The group realized that some of the attacking force were an illusion. Having lost two of their number, they decide the place is not safe and sail back north to Stromfjord. On the way, encountering five sleeping men with containers of deer marrow and blood, whom they kill on the assumption they are outlaws. Karasnefi then takes one ship north in search of Thorhall, finding a desolate forested area where they lay upon the bank of a river that flows westward to the sea. Chapter 12. Thorvald, traveling with Carl Sneffi, is killed by a uniped that shoots him in the groin with a bow and arrow. Carl Sneffi buries him in Vinland, in the area of what is present day Nova Scotia, Canada. The ship returns to Stromfjord but amid increasing dissension, they decide to return home. Karl Sneffi's son, Snorri, born in the new land, is three years old when they leave. In Markland, they encounter five Skraelings. The three adults sink into the ground and escape, but they capture the two boys and baptize them. They learn from the Skraelings that are cave dwellers ruled by two kings named Avaldaman and Avaldadida, and that a nearby country is inhabited by people who go about in white, carrying poles with cloth attached, and shouting. The saga writer says that this was thought to be the legendary Hivitramamanaland, and one version adds that this was also called Great Ireland. They sail back to Greenland and overwinter with Eric the Red. Chapter 13. The ship with the rest of the expedition under another Icelander, Bjarni Gramolfusson, is blown off course into either Greenland Sea or the sea west of Ireland, depending on the saga version, where it is attacked by marine worms and starts to sink. The ship's boat is resistant, having been treated with tar made of seal blubber, but can carry only half those aboard. At Bjarni's suggestion, they draw lots, but on request, he gives up his seat in the boat to a young Icelander. Bjarni and the rest left on the ship to drown. Those in the boat reach land. Chapter 14. After a year and a half in Greenland, Karl Sneffi and Gudrid return to Iceland, where they have a second son. Their grandchildren become the parents of three bishops. Analysis. The two versions of the saga of Eric the Red in the 14th century Hawks book 
and 17th century paper copies and the 15th century Skull Holtz book appear to derive from a common original written in the 13th century, but vary considerably in details. Hakar Erlensen and his assistants are thought to have revised the text, making it less colloquial and more stylish. While the Skull Holtz book version appears to be a faithful but somewhat careless copy of the original. Although classified as one of the sagas of Icelanders, it is closer in subject matter to medieval travel narratives than to either the sagas about families and regions of Iceland or those that are biographies of one person and also unusual in its focus on a woman, Gudrid. The saga has numerous parallels to the saga of the Greenlanders, including recurring characters and accounts of the same expeditions and events, but differs in describing two base camps at Stromforth and Hop, whereas in the saga of the Greenlanders, Thorfinn Kjarlsnefi, and those with him settle in a place that is referred to simply as Vinland. Conversely, the saga of Eric the Red describes only one expedition led by Karlsnefi and has combined into it those Eric's son Thorvald and daughter Freydis, which are recounted in the saga of the Greenlanders. It also has a very different account of the original discovery of Vinland in the saga of Eric the Red, Leif Erikson discovers it accidentally when he is blown off course on the way back to Greenland from Norway, while in the saga of the Greenlanders, Bjarni Hjolfsson had accidentally sighted land to the west approximately 15 years before Leif organized an exploratory voyage. This last is thought to stem from the saga having been written to incorporate a story that Leif evangelicized in Greenland on behalf of Olaf Tryggvason, which appears to have been invented by the monk Gunlaug Leifsson in his now lost Latin life of King Olaf, circa 1200. In order to add another country to the list of those converted to Christianity by the king, as a result of incorporating this episode, the saga of Eric the Red often associates the same events, such as Eric's fall from his horse, with different voyages than the saga of the Greenlanders, which apparently predates Gunlaug's work. The saga of Eric the Red contains an unusual amount of pagan practice, sorcery, and ghost stories. It has been used as a source on Old Norse religion and belief, in particular on the practice of prophecy as described in the scene with Jorburg, but is often described as unreliable. One scholar has described it as a polemical attack on the pagan practices still supposedly prevalent around the year 1000 in Greenland. And that's the summary. And soon, in the next uh, week or two, I will be reading the saga in its entirety. I hope that you enjoyed that. If you did, please give me a like, subscribe, share the channel. Thank you.